So last week's Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade has rocked the nation and the legal world. And it wasn't the only huge decision from the court in the past few weeks. There were also super important decisions made related to guns, to the Second Amendment, to free exercise of religion and schools. And as of this recording, there are still a few more really big decisions related to prayer in public schools and the limits of environmental regulation. So I wanna be clear, this video is not gonna provide a constitutional or legal exegesis on these issues. There are already a lot of those out there. We're gonna do something that I think is actually more fun and more central. We're gonna look at these cases from a negotiation perspective. And in the end, you're gonna see that negotiation is at least as important as any constitutional or legal interpretation, and maybe more so. Here's the deal. As a negotiation professor in a law school, and as someone who's also a lawyer, I have always known this dirty little secret, and it's a secret that many law professors and most judges simply don't want to admit, and it is this that despite the fact that in theory, judges are nonpartisan interpreters of the law, I will confront every case with an open mind. I will fully and fairly analyze the legal arguments that are presented. I will be open to the considered views of my colleagues on the bench. And I will decide every case based on the record, according to the rule of law, without fear or favor, to the best of my ability. And I will remember that it's my job to call balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. So this just isn't true. Where the Supreme Court lands on many of the most controversial issues of the day isn't primarily about pure interpretation of the Constitution or interpretation of the law. Judicial decision making is as much about negotiation as it is about law or the Constitution. Now, let me remind you what negotiation is, right? It is any communication between two or more persons with an intention to influence and to persuade. And the reality is that the nine Supreme Court justices are literally constantly negotiating with each other what the outcome of the cases are going to be and what the language of the opinions are going to be. They are constantly trying to influence and persuade each other around these contours. So let me just break this down and cut through some of the legal mumbo jumbo BS. First, it is totally true that legal interpretation and something we call judicial temperament or philosophy do play a major role in Supreme Court decision making. I mean, I don't know how many of you were surprised at last week's decision overturning Roe v. Wade. I certainly wasn't. And it wasn't just because an opinion leaked in May. It's because I know enough about conservative legal interpretation and conservative legal judicial temperament to see it coming. I don't think that many of us were really surprised. But make no mistake, right, on many of these controversial issues, where judges land and how they articulate their opinions is nonetheless a product of this elaborate and complex multi-party negotiation that takes place over an extended period of time. So let's start where all good negotiation experts start, which is around process. So if you've been watching my videos, you know that I talk a lot about process because the way in which we talk about and negotiate issues often frames the kind of substantive issues, the final results that we get. So let me break down what is the process that the Supreme Court uses to get cases and then render decisions on them. So the first thing, right, is how do they get cases? So every year, there are about 7,000 applications to the Supreme Court, so people who want the Supreme Court to actually hear their case. In the end, the court only hears about 100 to 150 of them. And this process is what's called granting a writ of certiorari. And the way the Supreme Court works is that four of the nine justices have to vote in favor of granting a writ before the court actually takes the case. Okay, so once the court has taken this case, the next step is that the parties submit briefs, but also others who may have an interest in the decision are also invited to submit briefs. And those briefs are called amicus curiae or friends of the court. So the idea is these are people who are going to try to educate or inform the court on what they think the right decision would be. By the way, all of this is negotiation, right? Trying to, in this case, influence the thinking of the justices. Then we have the oral argument. So the oral argument is when advocates for both sides make their case to the Supreme Court. And by tradition, each side usually has a 30 minute oral argument. Now, many people think this is a moment when the 
advocates are trying to persuade the justices. And, and that's true, although the truth of the matter also is that most justices by this point kind of have an idea of where they're going to vote. But in fact, what's happening is that the justices are often using their questions of the advocates to influence and persuade their fellow justices on the court and to get a sense of what are the limits and contours of what the opinion might look like. Okay, after oral argument, the next step is each of the nine justices sits with their four law clerks and has a robust conversation back and forth, trying to, again, influence and form the contours of their own thinking on the issue. Then the nine justices meet privately in a private conference. They actually tend to do this two times a week on Wednesday and Friday, where they share their reasoning and ultimately take a vote on where they're going to land. And the way the justices share their reasoning is the chief justice goes first, and then each justice speaks in order of seniority on the court. So the most senior justice goes after the chief justice, down to the newest justice, which in this case is Amy Coney Barrett. Once the vote is taken, this is an important piece of the negotiation, by the way, um, then there's an assignment of who's going to write the majority opinion and who's going to take a, a crack at the dissent. Why is this important? It's important because whoever gets to actually write the opinion, they're kind of holding the pen. They have a lot of ability to craft the contours of the thinking um, and to get justices to join their opinion rather than write a concurring or a dissenting opinion. And so the way this works is that when the chief justice is in the majority, the chief justice decides who's going to get to write the opinion. And when the chief justice is not in the majority, then the senior most justice will assign the case to the person that he or she wants to write the opinion. And so this is a real powerful moment for that person to decide, should I keep this opinion for myself, or is there some value to giving it to another justice because it'll increase the likelihood that they'll stick with me, or alternately, they'll write it in a way that might bring another justice on board with my view. So it's a really important piece. So that's what the process looks like. And then from there, there's an exchange of opinions between the justices where they are negotiating language, the contours and extent of where the opinion will land. So let me just give you one example of just how powerful negotiation can be. And it's a relatively recent case. It dates back to 2012 when there was a case challenging the constitutionality of Obamacare. Now in Obamacare, without getting too complicated here, there are really two big issues for the court to address. One, could Obamacare expand Medicaid? And two, could Obamacare require people to buy health care insurance? So this is something called the individual mandate. At that initial conference, there was a 5-4 vote to allow Medicaid expansion, but then also a 5-4 vote to forbid the individual mandate. And the justice that flipped on those was Chief Justice Roberts. So Roberts said, okay for Medicaid expansion, not okay for the individual mandate. Now here's a key piece, that the real heart of Obamacare was around the individual mandate, not around Medicaid expansion. So liberal justices Kagan and Breyer saw an opportunity. And they saw this opportunity because they knew that they actually had a shared interest with Chief Justice Roberts, which is around the integrity and kind of sense of nonpartisanship of the court. And so over a period of time, they approached Chief Justice Roberts and ultimately got him to switch his vote on both issues, meaning that in the end, Chief Justice Roberts writes an opinion that upholds the individual mandate on a novel constitutional interpretation, which is the right of the government to impose a tax and saying that the individual mandate was a tax, but then invalidates the part of the law that allows Medicaid expansion. So this was a crafty negotiation because it allowed Roberts to split the difference, but from Kagan and Breyer's perspective, it allowed the heart of Obamacare to actually live. So that's just one example. There are so many more examples. So for example, uh, the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. So this was a landmark decision that ended up with a 9-0 vote, right? A unanimous court, something that we rarely see these days. But when the court first took its vote, it was far from unanimous. This 9-0 decision comes by dint of a complex and skillful multi-party negotiation amongst the judges. You can actually learn more about these deliberations by checking out this great series by Nina Totenberg at NPR. Uh, we're going to put the link into the description. Or you could read this wonderful Law Review article from St. John's Law Review, uh, also link in description. So if we think about this recent Dobbs decision, the one that overturns Roe, 
you will remember that back in May, the draft opinion was leaked. Now, is it possible that this leak was just a pointless act of sabotage? Yeah, it's possible. Is it likely? Mm, not very likely, right? It is almost certainly the case that someone leaked this opinion in an attempt at negotiation. So in an attempt to either persuade some of the justices to keep their vote where it was, or to attempt for the justices to actually switch their vote. Now, we may never actually know what the impact of that leak was on the final decision. One thing we do know is that the final opinion differed from the draft in two important ways. One, the final opinion spends a lot more time addressing the arguments of the dissenting opinion. And two, the final opinion spends more time expressly limiting the extent of its reasoning to abortion and not to other rights such as contraception, same-sex relationships, marriage equality, or interracial marriage. Now, truth of the matter is, there are countless stories of the Supreme Court justices using their influence and negotiation techniques with colleagues to craft decisions and opinions that are likely. So, while you might want to believe that judges are simply interpreting the law from some impassioned or omniscient or principled position, the reality is, just like all of us, they're using their influence skills to negotiate outcomes that advance their own view of the world and their own preferences. So, in light of the overturning of Roe, along what seems to be very partisan and political lines, what can we do or hope for here? Right? One thing we know is it's going to be harder for the justices to retain the kind of trust and good rapport that we know as negotiation experts are needed to reach consensus-based value-creating outcomes. And without successful negotiation skills, we're going to sadly see more bitterness, more division, and more extreme opinions in the future. So for the good of the country, and I would just say wherever you sit on the issues, you should hope that the justices can find a way to forge more consensus and more mutual gain in their negotiations. You know, some of the remaining justices on the court actually show an interest in this, specifically Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Elena Kagan. And we certainly know that there are a host of retired or soon to be retired justices who are still alive, from Justice Breyer to Kennedy to Souter to O'Connor, all of whom are really committed to this kind of problem-solving internal negotiation. So it's hard to know what's going to happen next, but I want to end this by saying there is some reason to hope. Because when the court begins its next term, there's going to be a new justice, Katanji Brown-Jackson, joining the court. History suggests that even a single change on the court's composition provides an opportunity for the court to reset its relationship. So for the good of our country and our rights and our institutions, my hope is that there's going to be a negotiation reset in the next term. Okay, so if you are looking for some more reasons for good news and hope, please stay tuned and watch the next video, which breaks down the historic equal pay agreement between U.S. Soccer and the Women's Soccer Association. And of course, I'd be really grateful if you could like this video, ring the bell, and please subscribe to my channel. I'm Bob Bourdon, and let's keep negotiating together. Okay, you know you want to hear this feel-good story about U.S. women's soccer. Stay tuned.